uh, this particular trilogue <coughs> is titled Saving the World. And I thought it would be interesting to discuss this theme, first of all, because I think that there's a great deal of uh, pessimism about the subject, saving the world, that people feel that if they can imagine a set of policies or uh, actions that might be taken to save the world, that then somehow uh, these policies are... Uh, unlikely to be realized because the inertia of uh, human bad habits will somehow interfere with the best intentions and that uh, hortatory ravings of the Sermon on the Mount variety have clearly failed if mere speaking about saving the world could do the job it would have been saved quite some time ago so what's needed then is a, a, a notion or a set of notions which will somehow um, not run counter to the general flow of uh, human needs weaknesses and expectations and yet create a radical change in um, the nature of our world. And as I look at the various factors which seem to be pushing the world toward ruin, the one that I come back to again and again as being central to any social program which would create a sane and caring future for our children and lessen the impact of human beings on the environment is the problem of overpopulation. All other social problems can be seen uh, as being driven by the excess of human population on the earth which has in our own lifetimes reached a criticality anticipated by Malthus and other pessimistic thinkers in the past and yet even as we speak there is no um, serious assault on this problem population growth and its handmaiden resource depletion are running rampant over the surface of the planet. Uh, is there anything that could be done to mitigate this situation and buy us a little time? And I think the general uh, feeling about this is no, there is not. That because people enjoy sex, because people enjoy family life, because uh, people are not educated concerning birth control and so forth, that somehow this is a problem we just avert our gaze from in the hope that perhaps war, epidemic disease, or some other natural catastrophe will intervene and do the work that we as uh, human planners have been unable to do. And I think this is a profoundly misguided and pessimistic uh, position to take. Uh, I was once challenged in a workshop I gave. Someone said to me, uh, well, you're always talking to these uh, entities in the higher dimensions. Why have you never asked how to save the world? And at first I took it as a, a kind of facetious challenge on the part of someone who didn't really understand the protocols necessary for dealing with these entities on the higher planes. But then I thought more about it and I thought, uh, if this is a legitimate source of information, then this would certainly be a legitimate question to pose to these entities that profess such affection for humanity. And so the next time I entered into dialogue with the, the botanical logos, I posed this question, how can we save the world? 
and with a lag time of under a third of a second, the reply was given. Each woman should bear only one natural child, the Logos told me. I have to confess, this was an idea that I had not given a great deal of thought to. I don't think very many people have. And so I would just like to sketch for you the consequences of this and some interesting facts that I've come upon in the process of looking into it. First of all, let's just take it at face value. Each woman should bear only one natural child. Now, what would be the demographic consequences of this? Startlingly, within 50 years, the population of the earth would be cut in half. Without war, epidemic, forced migration, government programs of sterilization, so forth and so on. If a policy like this were adopted uh, by even a major percentage of the world's women, uh, the impact would be immediate. Uh, in the succeeding 50 years, the Earth's population would fall by half again. If such a policy were in place for 150 years, a serious social debate would ensue on a subject inconceivable to us. Are there now enough people in the world? Um, I took this idea and I began to look into the demographics of population and I made a very interesting uh, finding which I have not heard widely repeated in the media even uh, among the people who uh, are concerned about the population problem, and that's the following. A child born to a woman in Malibu or uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan or Berkeley or Hampstead Heath, in other words, a child born to a woman in a high-tech industrial society in the upper class of that society will have between 800 and a thousand times greater negative impact on the resources and carrying capacity of this planet than a child born to a woman in Bangladesh or Zaire. This is something we are not often told. When we think about the population problem, we tend to think that it's little brown people on the other side of the world who just perversely refuse to stop having children. But in fact, this is not what is going on. Converting a woman in Malibu to the notion that she should limit her uh, reproductive life to one child is the equivalent to converting 900 to 1,000 women to the same proposition in Bangladesh or Central Africa. If we were to go to the third world and meet a woman who told us that her ambition was to have 800 to 1,000 children before she died, we would imagine ourselves to be standing in the presence of a social criminal, a, a person so callous to the needs of the earth and the present state of humanity as to be almost beyond conceiving. Yet, in fact, this is the position held by any woman in a high-tech industrial society who chooses to have more than one child. There are a number of interesting factors about this. First of all, if we were seriously to propose this idea, one woman, one child, um, traditionally among demographers, population policies have been most difficult to sell in traditional societies. Be, uh, traditional agrarian societies because in those societies having large numbers of children is linked to centuries of religious and social tradition 
And so then great frustration spreads back uh, among the advocates of population control because these traditional women are unwilling to make this commitment. In contrast to this, think about the uh, woman in Malibu or Hampstead or the Upper East Side of Manhattan. She is college educated. She has access to excellent medical information. She is she should be an easy sell to this idea. She is not burdened by centuries of religious tradition. She is a modern, secular, progressive, liberal person. Every woman of that type converted to this policy is the equivalent of converting 800 to 1,000 women of the other type to this policy. I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that it's important that the um, concerns and wishes of the individual be commiserate with this large-scale social goal. Notice that you can say to this college-educated, upper-class woman, how would you like to have more leisure time, save a pile of money, and be hailed as a political hero. All you have to do is limit your reproductive activity to one child. Now, to the obvious objection that people want large families and want more than one child, you say, the cities of this planet swarm with children without families. We're not saying you can't have a house full of children. We're simply asking that you address your unconscious genetic chauvinism and limit the expression of your own genetic heritage to one child. You may fill your house with unwanted children from other parts of the world. In fact, we encourage you to do so. So this is a plan where the... Uh, goals of the individual, and I think most women of this class I'm talking about, would do desire more leisure time and are not immune to the attraction of saving money and would certainly like to think of themselves as behaving politically correctly. Now, another interesting thing about this proposal is it's the first plan I've ever heard for having an impact on the destiny of our species that does not depend on men. Women claim that men run and ruin the world very well. Let women limit their reproductive activity to one natural child and save the world and increase their leisure time and wealth at the very same moment. Now, several objections have been put forward to this idea. The first is I've been told that I do not understand the nature of political power and that political power resides in numbers and that what I'm asking people to do is to diminish their political power by diminishing their numbers. I reject this idea because if political power resided in numbers, China would be the most powerful nation on earth, followed close behind by India. In fact, these are, uh, they hardly place in the first five. That's an archaic notion of what constitutes political power. Political power is constituted by money, the control of abstract resources. This is a plan by which more money would accrue to people who were making this step. So I've asked myself, why if our planet is truly threatened with extinction and social chaos by overpopulation, we've heard nothing of a plan of this sort. And I think that uh, after some thought on the matter, that the reason for this is because capitalism 
is a, the system under whose aegis we are operating, and nobody knows how to make a buck in a situation of collapsing demographics. In other words, capitalism unconsciously rests on the premise of an ever-expanding population of workers and consumers of the goods which capitalism is set up to produce. I don't think that the preservation of capitalism is a sufficient reason to ruin the world and rob ourselves and our children of a sane future. So I would uh, submit to you that this extraordinarily simple idea appealing to all the venal drives of the individual could in fact be harnessed into a set of social policies which would very, very quickly have a major impact uh, on the planet. In fact, I'm interested in seeing computer simulations run. How many of these high-tech women would have to convert to this notion before there would be an enormous freeing up of resources a very small percentage. I mean, I would suspect that if 10 or 15 percent of the women in, a, in the wealthy classes of high-tech societies were to do this, there, the uh, impact on resource availability would be measurable almost immediately. It isn't the poor woman in Bangladesh who should be preached at to limit her reproductive activity. After all, her children rest on the earth as lightly as moths or mayflies. It is the children in the high-tech societies that consume more plastic, glass, steel, petrol byproducts and so forth than uh, uh, whole villages of people in the third world. So uh, I put this idea out, not only that it be debated on its own merits, but because I think it shows that in trying to solve problems that we've come to think of as intractable, we actually have fallen victim to a kind of failure of imagination, and that some of the problems which we tend to think of as insoluble are in fact quite soluble if we will only make the imaginative leap necessary to think about them in these kinds of terms. It was stunning to me to realize that without migration, war, disease, coercion, you could cut the Earth's population in half in 50 years and make a whole bunch of people leisured and wealthy in the process seems to me astonishing that these kinds of things have been overlooked. <clears throat> well, 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 <laughs> um, um. well, a provocative uh, point of view to which, firstly, several objections immediately spring to mind, um, and secondly, um, to which I have a counter-proposal or an additional one. Good. Um, my, the Sheldrake plan for saving the world. Um, but before that, first I should think that the incidence of single child families probably is 10 to 15 percent of the class of women that you talk about already. It's a very common phenomenon. Um, you know, the, the, it's, you know, the number of children is inversely related to income as a general rule and uh, quite a lot of women already only have one child. Um, secondly, the adoption plan doesn't seem to me to work. It would only work if the woman in Malibu adopted dozens of brown-skinned skin, uh, skin little children and then kept them living at a Bangladeshi level in her Malibu house. Um, the studies of adopted children, uh, adopted children in general are usually raised in a similar manner to people's own children and would immediately, Very important immediately be promoted to with the thousand-fold con uh, consumers. I know families who adopted children from, from S Sri Lanka and from Hong Kong and Vietnam and so on, and they're instantly promoted to the uh, maximum consumption class by the very act of adoption. So that point is, I think, quite invalid of yours. The adoption thing won't work. Um, 
So, I think the principal objection to the scheme is... Uh, oh, the third point. This is the very, the very policy of the government of China is trying to enforce for two or three decades now. Each family to have only one child. So, the scheme has actually been tried. And one has to say, in the case of China, it's had some success. The birth rate is slower there than in India. But it hasn't been completely successful because of the difficulty of enforcing it. Now, take your point that it's easier to sell to women in Berkeley than it is to women in Shanghai. Um, but the, the, um, I think the biggest problem to overcome is the prejudice against only children. Since all of us have had two children each, um, if we ask ourselves why we had two children rather than one, we certainly didn't have them because we thought we'd get more prosperous by having two children. It must have been obvious before we did it that we'd be poorer. It must have been obvious that there'd be a smaller amount of available resources to be spent on them. But there's a very strongly established feeling that somehow there's something wrong with being an only child. And that seems to be the most powerful psychological obstacle that has to be overcome for this plan to be put into operation. Maybe I'll leave it there, and now I'll come later to my, my own patent scheme for dealing with the demographic situation. Yes. Well, as I understand it, uh, Terence, you challenged the botanical logos to provide a solution, uh, and it came up with this plan, and then you derived these uh, demographic consequences which are startling to you and interesting. And if we were to achieve the gain that this plan proposes, we would then need a third step, which I guess hasn't been done yet, and that is to solve the problem how this plan is to be implemented. So, um, although I agree with Rupert that not wanting to insult the entity the fact is the plan is not very original um, still I'm going to suggest that you go back to the entity to ask how this would be implemented because in your demographics there is this very big if if every woman and so on now for every family to have one child let's say every woman to have one child is not demographically different from many families on the average having one child. That's a different implementation of the same policy. And many countries, developed countries, now do have approximately zero population growth, which means their average is about two. Right. So this one is less than two, and that's significantly less, and that's interesting. But as, as far as um, people adopting this plan, you know, putting this plan in force, persuading people, educating like them. Here's the big if. How do you, what is step three? How do you implement this plan? And this is, as a matter of fact, the real problem in saving the world. And it's the one that we've been talking about in several meetings in the past. Do you use education? This is a common theory that the reason that developed countries have achieved zero population growth is because of education, or do you change the mythology? I mean, all of the possibilities that we've discussed for making a paradigm shift, a social transformation in general, all of them would be applicable to this problem, but which? How? What? Through education, youth, rewards? How do you pr provoke the phase shift in consciousness which would result in people feeling as their personal goal to get the population growth of their neighborhood down to half. Well, minus I, 50%. You, you have to point out this thing that personal wealth and leisure time will increase if this policy is followed. In other words, people will follow their own best interests. So you have to you can't appeal to some higher set of goals. You just have to say, wouldn't you like to work less and have more money? Well I think there might be a solution to this problem, but I doubt that's it. I think that Rupert is right. There's a uh, a preference based on actual experience for two, not for two, for zero or two. What we would need here is to have more zeros and still some twos. 
And what is really missing, I think, is for a large number of women to accept that they don't want to have any children at all. That is the real problem. And of course, there already are many women who don't plan to have any children at all. But to increase the proportion of women who are choosing that as their first preference, the, the number of children they want to produce in the entire lifetime is zero, I think that's the difficulty. Yes, well, I think that celibacy is a misplaced impulse in this direction. Celibacy does, uh, it's arguable that it does anybody any good, but if it were redefined to be uh, thought quite a nice thing for people to make the sacrifice of having no children, and such people were honored in society in the way that we now honor celibate priests, or we recognize them as a special class. If people knew that by having no children, they would receive a certain measure of deference in society, then large numbers of people might opt for that. Yes, well, that's reason. The but I absolutely reject the connection between sexual activity and reproduction. I know, I've heard that there is some kind of connection. But I think that <laughs> the, um, the women, uh, uh, the po politically correct women in Berkeley and Santa Monica and so on that we're talking about, they are mostly having children because they want to. They've elected to. I mean, there are, there are lesbian women who have children because they want to. There are celibate people who have children because they wanted to have a child. They changed that pattern only because they wanted to have a child. The, the wanting to have a child is um, the cause of reproduction, not a uh, mysterious and unsuspected byproduct of, of being sexually active. So I think we need, in order to resolve this final problem in, your, in the entity's suggestion, we need to find some educational or mythogenetic strategy whereby people would really yearn to have zero children, with or without sexual activity. All kind of well, I think this could be done in all kinds of ways, through education, through tax incentives, through direct payment. Also, I'm not, I don't accept your... Direct payment. I, I don't accept the premise that faced with one's desire to have two children, or if that were linked to wrecking the planet, I think people would just have one child anyway. Yes, well, that's a possible breakthrough. And, in yes. fact, we don't know the consequences of having one child if it were generally accepted. I think a lot of the one-child talk that goes around has to do with the fact of the myth of the special character of the single uh, child and daycares, all kinds of social institutions could be retooled to make sure that these children spend a lot of time with other children. So I don't see that as a, a tremendous barrier. I agree with you. I think we should encourage people, one, to have no children. Those people should be given special honors. Otherwise to have one. Otherwise to have one. And never to have two. And never to have two. And people should accept that nuclear families don't really exist exist in this society, and so they're going to be single parents, and that makes it more attractive to have just one. That's because right. When two single parents, each with one, combine in a house, then in fact they'd have a sort of nuclear family with two children, except both the parents would be female. And the other thing is to start <laughs> in these high-tech societies. Don't start in India and Sri Lanka. That makes no sense whatsoever. Start in the areas where you're likely to make many converts. Then uh, these third world societies, which, always t are, which are tending to take their value systems from by emulation of the high-tech societies, would see the uh, positive feedback of these policies and could, would quite naturally uh, adapt them themselves in due time. Well, I think we do have a plan here. It's sort of rounded out. Well, let's hear Rupert's other plan. No, I, let me just raise one further objection which has to be overcome. I mean, first, giving single children and si single child families a better name is, seems to me the most important and you think the easiest aspect of this plan. Well, that's 
I mean, that seems very important. But studies on... I never saw the case against two children until we'd already got to. When I read an article in a, a newspaper in Britain, The Guardian, um, which was a, a fervent denunciation of the two-child norm. I'd never, ever seen this before. I'd seen plenty of things about what's wrong with only children. But this said that having two children is grossly abnormal. In, in the past, people had large families. We've had multiple children, multiple relationships. With, you ha- with, with two, you set up automatically a dyadic relationship of jealousy, possessiveness, and fighting, which creates a one-on-one competition situation which is atypical of the whole of human race in the past and that two children in fact may be a great deal worse than one now that was a strong argument it's the only time I've ever seen an argument put in favour of a single child as opposed to two Mm. and it was a well put case and it had quite an impact on me it might even have influenced um, my own thinking on the subject had I read it before we'd had two Mm. Um, so this, this, the, this re-evaluation of the role of two versus one children is, is something that a great deal more attention could be paid to. A, a, a studies could be made on the subject. It may well turn out that this argument can be validated in all sorts of terms and, and that the two-child norm can be discredited in, uh, as a kind of myth or ideal in favour of the one-child norm. Now, that would be a highly constructive act together with social policies that would deal better with the problem of only children and all the rest of it. Some ways of living or where children spend more time with other children. And anyone with a single child spends most of their time ferrying the child around to other houses so they can play with other children. This could be made easier. But there's a serious political objection to the whole thing, which is that in a democratic society, in a democratic society of one person, one vote, um, the, s- the single most important thing that influences people's thinking about this question is being outvoted by the others. In, Ca- in, Ireland, in Northern yes. Ireland, the great fear is the Catholics have more children than the Protestants, and they'll take over. In the Soviet Union, the fear many Russians have is that the Muslim republics have enormous birth rates compared with uh, European Russia, and that in a democratic Soviet Union, they'll take over. The fear in the United States surely must be that for the woman in Malibu or Santa Monica that within five years, maybe ten years, Hispanics will take over control of Los Angeles within 25 years or 10 years, 15 years of California and within 50 years of the entire United States. And then they'll change the rules because they believe in larger families and they won't want to go along with this kind of norm. That's the kind of objection which I think will strike... uh, people yes. very deeply and raise tremendous fears. I think there's an answer to that particular <coughs> objection, which is uh, by takeover, what you mean is claim an unfair amount of the wealth of the society political or the resources power. of the political power. But notice that um, in a society where this kind of policy was slowly taking hold, all segments of society would grow more wealthy and there would be a diminishing anxiety about resource availability because there would be an ever-expanding available pool of resources. In other words, if we're going to uh, cut the Earth's population in half, then there's going to be twice as much land and wealth to go around. And so people would see themselves progressively uh, enriched, generally and specifically. I mean, in the world where the population is dropping by 50% every 50 years, every time you got your mail, you would learn that a distant cousin's line had died out and that his estates and bank accounts had been ceded to you. So you think a chain letter principle is the one... (laughs) (laughs) That's the big yet again, because Terence, you already accepted the fact that in Bangladesh the population growth is not going to decrease only in Santa Monica and Berkeley. No, at first in those places. I'm saying don't preach it in Bangladesh at first. Demonstrate it in the high-tech societies and everyone else will follow along. And as a society becomes more wealthy, that means more educated, uh, the case will make more and more sense. 
it's something that hi it's interesting that the burden of of working this all out would fall on the women in the high tech societies who are have claimed that they have never taken their due uh, role in human destiny and here would be a chance for them to step forward and lead us all into a better world by their demonstration. Well, I think in the case of our own experience in our own families and co-parenting arrangements, we had participated with our wives in the discussion about how many children to have and, and, and so on. And uh, that probably would be the case in these high-tech developed countries and families and so on. It would be a sort of a partnership in men and women that would have to come to this new understanding. But women would take a, clearly a, a flagship role in all this. Yes. Well, suppose that, yes, suppose that uh, Rupert's idea that a reason for large families and anxiety about the voting situation in democratic countries and well, we could change the vote so that uh, siblings of the same mother would share one vote. That would take care of that. <laughs> I think there are cleaner ways to take care of that. I mean, I see this objection, but I think it could be met that social planners, you could put in place incentives. I think it could be met. People are anxious. They don't want to lose power or wealth or land. And the very notion of, of falling demographic reverses this pressure. And everyone even the, those for whom the policy is working least well are still living in a better situation than if the policy were not in place. If the policy is not adopted or something like it, we all lose. If the policy is adopted, most of us would gain. Well, if we accepted, just for the sake of discussion, that the present population of the planet is an okay number, then we don't have to seek a decrease, then zero population growth on a planetary scale would be our goal. Let's just... But it's just a more gentle... No, it isn't true, but for the sake of discussion, let's consider that. Um, then we already have achieved our goal in developed nations, many of them, and not in the rest of the world. So according to your idea, if this would apply to the one-child plan that um, the success of this plan would then um, diffuse over the underdeveloped countries, that we should see that already happen, and, and yet we don't. No, I think we do. Mm. As, uh, in, as standards of living rise, uh, population rates slow. This has been observed all over the world. I know, but the standard of living is not rising because the population is growing and outstripping the resources, and people have this enormous famine in Africa, and their response to this famine is to have more and more children. In order to but for instance, survive. in Thailand, South Korea, the emerging uh, industri the industrial countries of Southeast Asia, uh, the population is slowing, and the, it's generally accredited to the rising standard of living and expansion of the industrial base. Yes. I mean, there's one further point, perhaps not such a serious one, which is the thing that terrifies people as well is, is not just being outvoted by the increase of one section of the population relative to the other, you know, like Hispanics, but also the question of immigration. And in Vancouver, for example, within five years, there will probably be a majority of Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese, are flooding in every day, great plane loads of them. Um, just buying up a lot of property in Vancouver. Uh, Mexicans are flooding into the southern parts of the United States. This idea of people flooding in. You know, the Germans are now getting worried that East Germans have they thought by unifying the country they could decrease immigration from East Germany. In fact, it's increased. And now everyone in Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, with any ambition and who's prepared to move, looks to Western Europe as the place to go. Any moment, people in West Germany are really afraid. 
if there really is a kind of European economic free zone that includes all of Europe, a free movement of peoples, just what they've been claiming they want for, 50, for 30, 40 years, they've been claiming this is what they want. If that's what they get, a hundred million Russians will probably want to move to West Germany. Um, you know, the, the problem of immigration becomes is, is a very serious problem for a lot of people and this is another way, reason as well as being outvoted by demographic increase within the, the, the same country the problem of immigration from others you know the yellow peril these kinds of things have been but these immigrations are fueled by population uncontrolled growth of population well they're not because Eastern Europe has had one of the lowest population growth rates in the world in the last 30 or 40 years so tough have the conditions been that the population of Romania and other countries in Eastern Europe has actually been falling much to the consternation of their governments they've had the lowest population growth rates anyway they've had negative growth rates the people aren't moving because they're so many want, they're moving because of but jobs. you see that's just a problem we will always have problems what we're trying to do here is figure out how to save the world no from we're here to chicken and egg problem because the, the, is the logical consequence of your theory is that we have to solve all the other pr problems of the world in order to solve the population problems so the uh, preposition at the beginning of your introduction that which which I concur that the population problem is the basic problem but somehow that's not really so logistically that you have to all nations have to be developed nations um, uh, people have to have education they have to accept this new idea they have to be impressed by the success of this plan as it's applied in other nations like all that implies the solution of all these problems so the demographic uh, shifts of a constant population in new locations would end because the inequalities of resources and um, that this would have been solved it, it well people will always migrate to where there are more jobs or better lives but if they are truly not migrating because of overpopulation in their homeland then they are emptying out their homeland and that means in the future there will be empty land to be reintegrated into the global economy uh, the price Germany pays now by having uh, millions of Poles move into Germany means that in the next century Poland will be a wonderful frontier for uh, economic growth and uh, a, a theater where people can build very stable happy lives yes well I I'm not completely convinced, I have to say, um, well, because I, I feel that, that the, the, these basic fears about immigration pressure, outvoted, other people taking over, are very, very deep-seated, and it would be extremely hard to remove those completely. I think you would just pass a law, as we have in the United States, that being here doesn't give you the right to vote. And most countries have laws like that. And no, are there countries where if you're just there, you can vote? Most countries make a very clear distinction between their citizens and recent immigrants. And you have to establish yourself, and uh, citizenship is not automatic. No, well, nevertheless, the fact is that in Germany they have a problem with Turkish immigrants. But it's not of being outvoted by them. Not, no, that's not the problem, in, except in certain localized areas. But there is this fear of kind of relative demographic, demographic increase. Well, maybe these are problems that are going on anyway. But I, I mean, I think that these would surface as soon as this policy of yours began to bite. I think that there'd be sort of nationalist movements, sort of white Caucasian movements springing up, you know, save the Caucasian race and that kind of thing. And I think one needs to have some kind of plan in place in advance to counteract this very obvious reaction that would come up immediately. Well, I, I think you're right, although these sorts of movements exist already. What you would hope is that this was a solution and that therefore the consequences flowing from it would, uh, over in a fairly short amount of time, outweigh the negative 
aspects of it and that people would see that their standard of living was rising, there were more resources to spread around, there was less a sense of encroachment and so forth and so on. I think if people could achieve zero population growth on a planetary scale, as we could regard this as a halfway step, from there they could progress. You could give them a period of several centuries uh, to get to the idea that what is really needed is a rapid reduction in the human population to 25% of its current strength. Well, but see, the longer you wait, the more resources you're using up. I mean, are there a couple of centuries worth of petroleum around? Are there a couple of centuries worth of hydroelectric power? Well, I think if zero population growth on a planetary scale were achieved in the very near future, if we could achieve that, we could achieve anything. Well, you would only achieve planetary ZPG if in large areas of the world you had less than ZPG because you, they would be t- you would be taking up the slack in those well, laggard areas. No. Uh, but whatever it is, it's even easier to achieve than what you're proposing because if people in, in uh, Southern California, let us say, are, are seeing that their sector of the population is going to decrease to half within 50 years in the same span of time that these other folks are going to be multiplied by four, then it's obviously not going to go. No one is going to accept that. Why not? The people in Southern California will be twice as rich. The people in the other area will be four times more impoverished. We're talking about, let's say, another sector of the population in Southern California, which is multiplying at a rapid rate with, let's say, uh, 12% population growth per year, so doubling the population in five years. Through immigration and increase. Yeah, well, that's the birth rate in Mexico right now, so it's increasing 12% per year. It can't be 12%. No? Nowhere's more than about 3.5%. Oh, excuse me. Maybe 2%. Fix this in transcript. Mm. Well, I'm not saying it. you're not it's going to save great. the planet with a snap of the finger. It's too great a but but since the other the things on the table to solve this problem are thermonuclear wars, synthetic viruses, pogroms, genocide, triage, and uh, computer-directed mass starvation, this sounds to me like a pretty good idea. Oh, well, you haven't heard my plan yet. I don't have that. It's this plan was um, conceived when I first went to India and um, was published in Nature in 1974. And the reason I had a slight... A, uh, wary attitude to plans for solving the world's population is that having had one myself and promoting it vigorously in international circles including various sort of international aid agencies and kind of working as part of one I had the air of um, people of influence and so on I was in a good position to do it um, the fact that nothing's come of it over um, you know, the next following 17 years has um, slightly discouraged me. Anyway, the scheme, as it goes, is quite simple. It's based on the perception that in third world countries and in um, advanced ones, but largely in countries like India, where population growth is greatest, people have lots of children, not because they want to have lots of children, acquire children, but because they want to have lots of sons. Yes. That point is, I think, quite clear. That you can talk to any Indian and any Chinese. What they want is sons. They don't want daughters. On the yes, world. the Chinese throw the daughters in the river. Yes, and so the Indians practice female infanticide in Rajput and other castes. And, and um, but they, what they go and pray, they spend good money on doing ceremonies in temples, pujas, to f- try and have more sons than daughters. Incidentally, this provides... Uh, a test of the power of prayer of a statistical kind. I checked out the male to female excess in the birth rate in India as opposed to other countries. It's 106 to 100 males to females in live births in India. So it is in Western countries where there's no such strong prejudice. So one could in favor of sons. So clearly, on a large scale, the magical and religious means used to try and promote the parents of sons are not effective, statistically speaking. They may shift the balance in individual cases but anyway this the fact is they want sons now rather than trying to go against the tide trying to persuade people to have less sons or less children now you give them what they want 
Now, it's, it was discovered in the early 70s that male sperm swim more strongly than female sperm. And in vitro, in test tubes, uh, if you put them in a viscous solution, any viscous substance will do, um, and they have to swim through it. There's a progressive enrichment of male sperm getting through the other side. Um, there are other ways of separating them that have been investigated by the artificial insemination industry because with cows, you know, you basically want to have females rather than males. So there's some research gone into this. Anyway, with human sperm, like many other species, male sperm swims stronger than female. My proposal was a simple technical uh, advance whereby a capsule of a viscous substance like carboxymethyl cellulose, very cheap, buffered, at an appropriate pH would be inserted before intercourse into the vagina. The sperm would have to swim through it in order to fertilize the egg, and this would give a preferential enrichment of male sperm. Now, the thing may be only partially effective. It may only re increase the chances to 60-40 instead of 53-50, uh, which is the present uh, ratio. However, even a slight increase, as long as it was perceived as being increasing the chances would lead to rapid adoption of this thing even if it was banned by governments a black market would spring up immediately um, uh, the product would be extremely cheap to make assuming that this technical problem could be overcome you know you could make the product technically um, the result of this let us assume that it could work to, with an efficiency say of promoting the chance of 75 to 25 in favor of science it's a reasonable assumption um, it would be widely adopted. The proportion of boys would increase. The number of children required to achieve the right level, the desired number of sons would go down, so there would be a more adoption of birth control immediately. Um, but, of course, the main consequences would come within one generation time, which is about 15 years in India, since the average age of marriage for girls is about 14 in most parts of India. Um, then, of course, the, there would be the consequence would be there would be a shortage of girls. Not all these young men could get married to girls. Um, or even if you had a system of, of polyandry developing, the rate limiting fact for population growth is, is the number of women. So, yes. it, it, you, you know, it, women couldn't increase childbearing beyond one child a year maximum, however many men they were married to or had sex with or whatever. So there'd now be an immediate bottleneck on population growth. Population growth would begin to plummet. Um, there'd, of course, be social consequences associated with this. And most Westerners who had this plan said, well, of course, they'd all get militaristic. You'd have appalling wars. But that's not the reaction I heard from anyone in India. The Indians don't have such a militaristic tradition. I mean, they... they what would probably happen there is that you'd get a rise in age of, at which men could get married. And instead of a dowry system, which is what causes people to not want daughters, you know, there'd be the rapid development of a bride price system as people would have to bid higher prices to get the available girls, um, which would solve another problem, namely the low social status of women and the desire not to have daughters. And within 30 years, the whole system would re-equilibrate re because the desire to have sons rather than daughters would cease to have the same motivation. The entire social pattern would adjust. There would be social problems in between, but nothing like the social problems caused by the doubling of the population in the next 25 years. This plan, uh, which would go with the grain, of what people want rather than against it. Technically uh, conceivable and probably achievable if enough research were devoted to it. None has been so far. Um, uh, is, I submit, another way of tackling this problem. Although it doesn't address at all the impact on resources of children born in high-tech societies. It's again a little brown people are the problem theory. Well, it, it's, well, little brown people are the problem in, in large parts of Africa and Bangladesh and so on. Well, the, the, the locally, for the other, yes. But on a global scale, it's the over-consumption uh, that goes on in the high-tech society. That's true. I read um, in the last week, and I've forgotten where, that the um, inhabitants of Orange County, California, consume as much in terms of uh, petroleum products, raw materials, and energy is the entire population of the Indian subcontinent. 
this gives you a notion of the disparities that we're talking about. Here. Yes, yes. Well, so this the, the it's a separate issue. I think the resource depletion, uh, the factor of eight hundred to a thousand, that's a, a questionable. I think uh, Rupert's plan, which does sound like like it would create a global decrease in the rate of population growth. This is definitely would help save the world. And furthermore, I think that we could go into business and make a fantastic profit by selling the product at reasonable rates in India and China. So let's do it. Well, I'm not sure it would save the world. The problem is resource depletion. However it happens... Well, we could just have rationing in Southern California, then that would cover it. We would by have a factor of, uh, we're going to cut people back by a factor of 800 to 1,000? Well, it sounds difficult, but I think it's actually easier than affecting the population growth. What you then have in place is a tremendously coercive invasion of people's lifestyles and desires. That's exactly what we were trying to avoid. What you want is a system where people embrace it and practice it because it gives them more of what they want. That's exactly the virtue of my scheme. But not what Ralph's plan so is. If people in Southern California and in Texas and so on, are using the exorbitant amount of energy. <coughs> Because they're living in the wrong place. People should not live in a desert. So now we're going to add forced migration to the time. If if you want to save resources, then you could affect the world much more rapidly by moving people to different locations than you could by trying to affect the the birth rate. But all of these ideas smack of totalitarianism, fascism, and so forth and so on. I, I, I see the merit in what Rupert's saying. I think these two things could be practiced concomitantly. This entire scheme that he's proposing could be put in place in the third world, while the scheme that I'm proposing could be put in place in the first that world. That is a good idea. And then so we have the double got it. Furthermore, I think that the effect of Rupert's plan could be accelerated, uh, adding enormously to our profits in private enterprise by <coughs> advertising and trying to um, affect the bride price for a more rapid inflation of bride prices than would simply result by waiting for the demographics to do it. Just to give people the idea that... Uh, Brides uh, are more valuable. uh, Because you see, what we want to do in the in you're right. In the third world, what we want to do is have less people. In the first world, what we want to do is have less consumption. That's right. So this two-track plan Mm -hmm. would reduce populations in the third world. It would also have a. tend to reduce populations in the first world, but that wouldn't be the primary impact of, of my suggestion. The primary impact uh, in the first world would be uh, to lessen the impact on resources. So the two plans running side by side, it seems to me, would be uh, quite a reasonable thing to place before uh, another idea that should really be added to this concoction is the liberation of women, because I don't think that uh, girls of 14 can really be getting married. You see, that's the whole problem is that childbearing starts too early. Here we have college and everything. And well, if you, have women, if you have women in the high-tech countries having only one child, then they are appropriating more wealth and more leisure time to themselves. And these are the definitions of liberation in a secular society. More wealth, more leisure time, more control over your own body. So it would liberate women quite as an ingrained consequence of these other things. I think that's the basis for a short book here. (laughs) 
Well, here we've got a plan, a two-track plan that could indeed work. Um, but coming back to your scheme, it seems to me that the, the, one of the things that's really important to get in place is, is a research thing on family dynamics, actual interview techniques of people, why they decide to have two children. Yes. Um, actually get to the bottom of it, because the whole thing isn't based on a tremendously careful analysis. It's no. basically... It's, it's mythology. It's a kind it's of mythology. Spock, you see, it's numerology. Well, it's family numerology. Um, uh, don't don't you think that the, uh, the objection to the only child is um, actually a... No, it's a stylistic objection. They're not screwed up. They are not children. And this is a tremendously mm. sentimental society. I've known many only children, and many of my peers are only children, and they... Uh, left childhood rather quickly. They learned to read sooner. They became little adults. And since, I don't know when, the Victorians or something, there has been a deep sentimentality in Western society about childhood. But this is very recent. I mean, in the Middle Ages, children of 14 led empires. And so the idea that the only child is undesirable is simply a sentimental attachment to well, the well, notion well, of childhood. We're speculating in an area where there may be a great amount of data. And I think instead of trying to um, dope this out on intellect alone, what we might do is propose research projects to check some of these questions. I, I have a feeling, maybe this is wrong, it could be checked. I have a feeling that uh, problems such as codependent syndrome might be very severe with single children. Anyway, this uh, is part of the, the numerology should be based on research. And here we've got an ideal grassroots research project. Exactly. Since this doesn't require expensive apparatus, atom smashers or anything, but rather a sensitive... Uh, interview type investigation and investigation of family dynamics which can be carried out by people with a limited training in, in these things but asking the right kinds of questions something which anybody can understand and maybe many studies have already been carried out and the literature is there to be looked up in it may well be a sociological yeah. question as you're not going to reach the bedrock of truth I mean one school is going to tell you two children is good, another is going to say one child, and another uh, three to five. Yes, but the fact is that we've arrived at the frontier of the social sciences in an area where the further evolution of social science could be of crucial value in solving world problems. Social sciences are valuable. Now, there's something radical. Finally, I'd like to put in a plug for mathematics. I think there are many factors in cooperation. Here we have the the mythology, the psychological factors, the resources, the education, in, in, in order to test a, an intervention, a hypothesis before doing it, before we manufacture all these viscous uh, pill implants and, and <laughs> distribute them on the cheap um, in India, <laughs> we should do a computer simulation and it just get the, the, a, a little practice in the interaction of these well, the demographic, this is what demographers do. They know exactly how to run these simulations. Mm -hmm. and hardly, because the complex dynamical systems theory that's necessary to understand the simulation has just come on the scene. But the time is here. I mean, this also can be... I mean, grassroots science can include computer simulations on desktop computers. Yes, I mean a simple demogra demographic a demographic modeling disk could be manufactured yeah. and sold by aerial press. Well, there's the same hand city, hand there's with these with things already with exist. a one dollar off coupon to yes. detach from the back cover of our next it's volume. A slight yeah. variation on SimCity, for example. We can subvert uh, Nintendo and Game Boy and so on that the children would be trained in SimCity. What what would be the effect of using this product? from uh, Trilog Inc. instead of not using it. Say, oh, well, then you get wealthy and your bride price goes up. And you say, what if, you know, you play what if games in this computer simulation that's distributed in game board so that people are brought up with these educational games. It's the new mythology. Well, I think, and especially for everyone in Bangladesh with the uh, PC. Game Boy in a couple of years. Game Boy is just 
you know, handheld PC. They will not all have Game Boy in a couple of years, or else. four or five years. Well, there may be there may be there may be Game Boys in Bangladesh. There may be Game Boys in in coffee shops that you can use for a fee of Thank one rupee or something. Game Boys. Um, but I. I think, though, that it also as part of this computer program, that the family numerology would be very important yes. because I've often had conversations with parents who have had three children and four children. And it's a very common topic of great interest. It really interests me yes. and it interests lots of parents. The dynamics of different and numbers of children. children. The second child always is like this, and the third child is always has that problem. And yes, and with three children, mean. which seems pretty good to me, I talk to parents of three children or people who've been had two other siblings, you know, and then there's this problem with the one in the middle gets left out, that kind of thing. Or, or there's, there's, there is a lot of information here, but models that could be made on computers, family dynamics models, yes. um, and these things. Uh, become much more widely appreciated rather than just relying on informal conversations and widespread prejudice. This could go a long way to reforming um, people's attitudes towards this. And, and it may be that uh, every kind of investigation may point to the fact that single children have real problems, it's not a very good situation, that's a risk one would have to take if one launched such a research program. Yes. But I suspect that it may not, and I think that the um, the puncturing of myths, this would probably be the single most constructive step one could take towards bringing about your plan. Yes, well, there would be a lot of modeling going on if any of this was undertaken. Because any time you shift the creo, then you want to model what the feedback consequences of all this are. And here is a multi-leveled problem that deals with genetics, flow of wealth, movement of peoples, uh, lifespans, economic viability, resource management. I mean, it's the entire ball of wax. But it doesn't take into account, it would have to, the um, biological or archetypal desires to have children in the first place. Because if you talk in terms of resource and disposable income, the richest people in America and everywhere else are gay couples. They have the highest disposable income. There was an article in the business section of the New York Times last week showing, saying that uh, estimates have shown, market research has shown that $210 billion per year is available as disposable income to gay and lesbian couples or, or people. Um, we don't and know that here is one of the largest uh, markets for you know, special targeted advertising and marketing strategies. Well, the fact is that if one only took economic factors into account, then everyone would be gay. Now, it's very clear that um, large numbers of people are not gay and are motivated by other concerns in having children other than disposable wealth and the things to which you're going to appeal. Now, what, just what are those kinds of concerns and motivations? Uh, I mean, I often meet people who haven't had children who ask with great curiosity, as I did myself before I had, you know, about what it, what's it like and so really trying to find out, really trying to find a basis for these decisions. And there's very little guidance at the moment, especially about numbers of children. Mm. So here's at least an idea for a book. The Only Child, a positive re-evaluation. Yeah. You know, that would be a bestseller for a start, because there are lots of only children who'd want to be positively re-evaluated themselves. Yes. And lots of parents with only children. A strong market. Um, but interviews with such families about what's going to... It, it, it would be a huge market. This book could be... We could get an advance uh, through Brockman tomorrow, if we were prepared to write it. But... You know, we've got lots of book ideas. Maybe we'll have to set up our own book idea agency. Well, we couldn't <coughs> sell on this one. If we made a proposal uh, and it succeeded off chance in getting a large uh, advance offered, we then could actually deliver the product by reinvesting some of the take in employing helpers. I mean, there's a lot of research and a little bit of writing. Mm. And with the aid of the research and reading the reports, and then we could more or less trilogue it into book form. Mm. In a weekend. Well, there you are. This would be a positive way of dealing very, with it. Very I, think, I think that the most important barrier to it is this prejudice against only children. I think uh, in the United States, certainly. I and England. And, in, and, and I think in Europe, Europe and Europe. indeed. 
the Western world. Indeed, not just the Western world, in India too, everywhere. Yes. It's a very, very widespread prejudice. Yes. And it's sort of the family version of uh, Terence's original theory here, you know, putting the burden on the women to make the decision. And it um, speaks to the current paradigm, which might be fictitious, that it's uh, nuclear families that are having children. Another idea would be to attack that myth, uh, helping people to accept the idea that uh, marriage is uh, temporary and it's an arrangement for co-parenting and it has a finite span. As statistics show the average length of a marriage is so many years and so on. If people accepted that also, I think it would have a very strong effect on the birth rate, the hypothesis that or maybe this could be a chapter in the, in the book on family numerology, the hypothesis of the, the, the myth, the incorrect myth that marriages last forever make a two-child family more attractive. Uh, it's uh, an aspect of denial. If one accepted the fact that most marriages only last for many years and that the door in, at the time of the divorce the average age of the children is seven and a half or something, people would uh, probably look more favorably upon uh, single ch ch child families. <laughs>